Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to my presentation, which is entitled Beyond the Jobs versus Environment Dilemma, Contested Social Ecological Transformations in the Automotive Industry. I'm glad for the invitation, although it's a little bit weird because I don't know actually <laughs> what uh, you've already heard in this uh, class and whatnot, so I hope that this somehow suits <laughs> to what you do here. Um, okay, so if you have any questions during my presentation, please uh, interrupt me uh, anytime. Okay, so I would like to start my presentation with a recent graph from the IPCC report uh, that deals with um, climate policies. So actually what you can see uh, with the kind of bluish and greenish lines is what it would actually take uh, to limit global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees and then you can see what we actually do uh, at the moment which is the red line. So what is uh, obvious uh, from this graph is that there is a huge so-called implementation gap between what we actually have to do, what we know that we would have to do and what we actually do. I would like to argue in my presentation that um, we can actually benefit from a political econo economy perspective. So from analyzing, identifying economic and political structures to better understand why this implementation gap occurs and how we might then eventually be better able to find some entry points to deal with these structural barriers. I would like to do so um, with the example of the transport sector and especially the automotive industry. Why uh, I would like to do this? Um, I mean, I guess you are all aware uh, the transport sector is the single most important contributor to the climate crisis. It's actually uh, a quarter of all CO2 emissions in the European Union that go back to the transport sector. Uh, also CO2 emissions from road transport, shipping, aviation have actually yearly increased in the last decades. There was a drop in uh, 2020 to, to the due to the uh, COVID-19 crisis, but uh, since then actually emissions have rebounded uh, again. The majority of transport related emissions can be attributed to passenger cars. Uh, that's what you see uh, in the graph. Actually, I'm in the middle of the screen, no? Or do you see it? Okay. Um, so these can actually uh, be attributed to passenger cars and uh, the automotive industry. So when we think about uh, mobility transformations uh, in transport studies, there is um, a kind of a, an approach of how we can think of uh, such transformations. And this is um, called the avoid, shift and improve uh, approach. So actually it says the most important uh, thing to do is actually avoid road transport. So <laughs> uh, have shorter distances between uh, places of work and places of living, mm, have uh, more basic infrastructure in communities to avoid um, transport uh, needs, etc. The kind of second best uh, option or the second step would then actually be to uh, shift road uh, transport. So to shift um, 
uh, transport from individual cars to public transport, but also very importantly to active uh, forms of cycling and walking, for example. And only then, as a, a third step actually, uh, we should try to improve um, road transport. So for example, lighter and more economical cars, but also more climate friendly driving engines like uh, electromobility, for example. The thing then is that uh, at the moment, uh, governments and industry usually focus <laughs> mainly on improving transport. So mainly focusing on switching from, um, from internal combustion engine cars to um, electromobility, while less focus is given to replacing and reducing transport. Another trend uh, that we see at the moment, I would argue, is that there is a lot of focus on behavioral change and user acceptance. So an, an important uh, critical transport scholar, for example, says research on car dependence tends to focus on the consumption and use of motor vehicles while neglecting the logics underpinning their supply. So we actually talk about how can we uh, drive consumers to accept uh, electromobility or to shift towards public transport, but we actually not really um, talk about the production and supply of cars. So uh, there I would say that a political economy perspective enables to better understand how consumption and use patterns interact with um, the production of cars and so to also better understand structural barriers to mobility transformation. So when we, when we kind of analyze, identify uh, political uh, economy structures, we can also uh, better understand why it's so difficult to transform uh, the system and how, what would be other entry points than only uh, focusing on behavioral change and user acceptance. And uh, when we do so, when we talk about uh, the, the industry, when we talk about um, the production of cars, uh, we also uh, very, uh, we kind of also have to take into account something that in the literature is called the jobs versus environment dilemma. So if we want to talk about the, actually that we have to reduce the production of cars, <laughs> that we have to uh, reduce uh, the automotive industry as such, we also obviously have to talk about people working uh, in this uh, industry. In the EU, for example, at the moment there are 13.8 million people, so more than 6% of the total workforce that are directly or indirectly employed by the automotive industry. And actually, very few studies deal with uh, the perceptions, imaginaries uh, of workers. How do these people envision change in the industries they are working in? So from such a perspective, the challenge is actually twofold. So mobility transformations have to be sustainable. So they have to radically reduce CO2 emissions, but they also have to be just so somehow to provide alternative opportunities for workers that are currently working in these industries. And so what I uh, like to do uh, in the upcoming presentation is I would like to give you some results of a research project uh, that we did um, 
until 2020, uh, where we tried to look into this uh, jobs versus environment uh, dilemma, kind of um, did interviews with uh, workers, so actually work councils uh, in the automotive industry in Austria. So, uh, I mean, I'm aware Austria is a relatively small country. It's not, the automotive industry is not comparable uh, to the one in France, in Germany. But I think nevertheless, the results that we have are actually interesting beyond uh, this case study. So we, so we did interviews with union representatives, with work council members, uh, but also with selected um, ministry representatives and, and management in the industry. And we wanted to better understand first, so what are actually the economic and political structures of the industry? And what are there for barriers, but also uh, potentials for a transformation in the industry? And then especially, how do workers in the automotive industry perceive future transformations? And how are these perceptions linked to these very structures of the industry? And finally, from this, what are entry points for transformative change from such a perspective that go beyond this um, individual consumption uh, perspective that I um, showed you in the beginning. Okay, so then uh, first uh, thing to do, I give you some overview about the economic and political structure of the industry. And first of all, I think that's the case for uh, a lot of um, countries. It, also in Austria, the industry is a job and growth engine. So there are almost 80,000 people employed in the uh, wide automotive industry, that doesn't sound much, uh, but for a small country like Austria, that's actually more than 10% of the industrial workforce, uh, which is obviously uh, huge um, and also explains some of the resistance of uh, the Austrian government to transform the industry. And also with regard to the, the wider uh, significance of the industry, it accounts for 8% of the industrial production. Second, and this is uh, a characteristic uh, maybe specificity of the industry in Austria, it's basically a supplier industry for international corporations. So this means that most of the companies that uh, we, we see do not produce cars, but they produce parts of cars that are then supplied to uh, other um, uh, companies. So 65% of the workers are employed in companies with headquarters elsewhere. So mainly in Germany, uh, but also in France, for example. So this is important when we talk about transformation because it says, or it means that actually little decision ma making power on industry is within Austria or within the, these very companies that we are talking about. Uh, third, and this is obviously connected to uh, the previous point is there is a high dependency on exports. So especially to the German automotive industry, so 87% of the products are imported and more than half go to the German automotive industry, which also explains why Austria actually backed uh, Germany in its resistance, for example, of the ban of the internal combustion engine at the EU level. Um, third point, as I just mentioned, is 
there is a high dependency on the ICE, so on the interna internal combustion engine technology. Mm, so one quarter of the production was focused on engines and gear units in 2018. So that's actually very important when we talk about uh, workers' perceptions uh, later on, uh, because uh, this means that, yeah, uh, workers cannot. I mean, this is very research intensive. So for example, when you compare this to the Eastern European um, automotive industry, which is also a supplier industry, but it's not very research and technology oriented. In, in Austria, it's interesting because it's a supplier industry, but it's very much, um, there is a lot of research and technology, mainly on the ICE technology. Good question. I don't know. <laughs> I would say it's value. Yeah. And a uh, fifth point uh, connected to this, obviously, uh, I think that's also the case for a lot of, um, of industries throughout Europe. Policies and institutions basically support uh, the automotive uh, industry. There is net tax revenue of about 10 billion euros uh, of the automotive industry. There are direct and indirect subsidies for privately owned cars with ICE technology. So these account for about 1.3 billion euros per year. This is, for example, such uh, that that's me. No. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so that's, for example, uh, things like the so-called diesel privilege or also uh, subsidies for commuters, for example. Um, I'm going to show you another slide where you see a little bit of these uh, aspects that I've been just talking about. Uh, so you see a map uh, of Austria here and you see so the dots and circles are basically major automotive companies and the size uh, is in relation to the number of workers uh, these companies employ. So the blue dots are actually those that supply mainly for the automotive industry. So you see that are, these are uh, the majority. The yellow ones then also supply for other industry. So other industries. So from a transformation perspective, you could say mm, for them it's easier. <laughs> they can just supply to other industries. Uh, so for electronics, plastics, uh, textile, uh, whatever. And then there is another layer, so the, the circles uh, actually represent those companies that are very dependent on the ICE uh, technology, uh, which are really a lot, especially in, in Upper Austria, which you can see, he, see here in the middle, there's kind of a competence center, also research center on ICE technology, which then uh, makes it really difficult to transform uh, these, this industry. Okay, uh, and so based on these economic and political structures that we identified, uh, we uh, then um, had, as I said, interviews with and also focus groups with uh, work council members with union representatives where we wanted to better understand how do workers in this industry imagine future transformations of the industry and how are these then connected <laughs> to uh, the various structures that we've seen. And we've identified mm, three different, what we call, imaginaries. Uh, and the first one, mm, 
is actually what we call an improvement uh, imaginary. This is very widespread, so there is a high trust in the actual improvement of the ICE technology. So I have one quote that um, is kind of a representative for uh, this imaginary where one uh, work council member said, I'm absolutely convinced that we will continue producing combustion engines even on a large scale. So, I mean, it's important. This was 2019. So um, I thought actually for <laughs> quite a bit that it has changed in the industry. Now I'm not so sure anymore, actually. So I think it's actually still quite uh, representative. Uh, second imaginary that we've uh, we found is something that we call uh, diversification imaginary. So that's uh, the perception of a partial diversification towards uh, more e-mobility. So what is important here that nobody actually thinks that there is a, a definite shift. There is a partial diversification. And the quote that I've uh, chosen reads, in 10 years, we will probably continue to work in the same areas. The question is only the proportion. Our areas of work will be combustion engine, the electric battery, and the fuel cell. So it's this idea we can act we actually work on the same things. We can diversify a little bit to deal with the, the crisis in the auto automotive industry, but it's not going to be kind of a transformative change in any way. And the third imaginary, imaginary that we identified, we call this transformation imaginary. It's very rare. <laughs> we actually, uh, there are not many uh, hints uh, towards such an imaginary, but there are some. And this would be um, workers that imagine uh, that actually more transformative change uh, is going to happen, that kind of challenge automobility as such, and that kind of envision a reduction of private cars. And uh, the one quote I, um, I, I took uh, for this is, the way I see it, there will be massive changes. This development cannot be stopped. And I don't think, I don't know whether individual traffic will be the top priority. I believe that much will have to go into public transport, especially in the urban centers. Car manufacturers, I read, reacting to this with car sharing, making cars available, so there are approaches. But I think they will become much more radical. So there are uh, these voices in uh, the workforce that we interviewed, but it's actually very rare. So what we see uh, from this is that there is a tension between what is necessary, so to cut emissions, uh, to deal with the climate crisis, and the kind of reality that there is a high trust in existing mobility patterns. So, and what we can also see is that these workers' perceptions uh, are very much interrelated or interact with the economic and political structures in the automotive industry. So, especially, so workers believe in improvement, in diversification, so they actually see what we call a crisis in the automotive industry that, w that they would react to with in improved uh, IC technology, diversified uh, products, but they do not really see a crisis of the automotive industry that would kind of be necessary for more transformative uh, change. So, um, 
from here, I would then like to give you some hints on, because this is actually not really something very hopeful <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So, but we've nevertheless uh, identified from this analyst, analysis um, some entry points. Uh, so how could we, um, so how could some of these uh, barriers, of these structural barriers be overcome? Um, and I would like to, to separate uh, the entry points in kind of what would be entry points on a union and company level from such um, a worker's perspective and then what would be entry points on a policy level. And on a union and company level, it was actually quite interesting to see from the interviews that there is very high trust in from the workers in their own qualification and expertise. So I, I brought uh, some, some quotes that underline uh, this trust, which I think uh, are quite nice and encouraging, actually. So one of the work council members said, these people, so his uh, fellow workers, are indeed great. There is a kind of collective intelligence. They always make the best of it. As we say, they make butter out of shit. So um, such a perspective actually, I think we, it's nice because there is no, they, they know that they are qualified uh, workforce. <laughs> this is also, for example, um, we presented in the next quote where one said, if you work in the automotive industry, you can of course supply any other area because the automotive area is one with the highest requirements. So they know that they are qualified. They know uh, that they have, they work in, um, and in, in an industry where they can also easily do other things. And that's actually from a, from a transformation perspective, I think quite encouraging. Mm, and the, the last quote uh, on this slide is actually a very <laughs> a specific example of, because uh, some of the, the workers also told us that they actually had other ideas <laughs> of what to do, uh, of what to reuse uh, than individual cars. And I brought one example that I find interesting uh, where they said, we have often suggested and protected the construction of fire engines. Just look at Greece, Portugal and other regions where <laughs> fires are common. Here the normal fire brigade soon reaches its limits. That's why we said, okay, let's take a truck vehicle and redesign it. Like on the airport, we put a water gun on top and water tanks inside. So that's actually a, a specific example of where they said, I mean, we have ideas of how to, to produce products that uh, are actually needed in times of climate crisis. Uh, and we do not uh, think, um, so actually I, what I think is important from these quotes is that because in the literature, in, in the literature on, on industrial and labor sociology, there is often kind of the argument that there is a specific pride of industrial workers in the products uh, that they produce. And from, <laughs> that's actually nothing that we, we found. So maybe that's uh, special in Austria because it's a supplier industry. <laughs> so these people do not produce cars. So they just produce parts. So it's not so important. Uh, for them where uh, they go. But uh, from a transformation perspective, it's, it's interesting and important that workers didn't say, well, we are so, so proud of producing cars, that's the thing we need to do. But they said, well, we uh, have good industrial jobs, that's important for us, but actually we could also produce something else. 
self assessment of the transferability of their skills is accurate. And another thing, it's a little unrelated, but did you also ask about what they think of automation um, in the industry? Mm -hmm. um, I cannot say if this is uh, accurate. I mean, I think you can say that, uh, yes, it's accurate that when you say you, you transform the industry towards other transport-related products, like public transport or wherever, I think it's accurate. Uh, so definitely. Um, but then, of course, it's not so easy. Yeah? You, you cannot just uh, from uh, one day to, to another change uh, the machinery, etc. But uh, I think from a... Uh, what I was thinking is, if, I mean, it has to transform, but even then, if the industry shrinks, do they think that they can move to a different industry? Because that's how I understood it. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Asking yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there were, there are programs uh, in in Austria that try to do this. For example, to move them to the um, uh, Wiener Linien, which is the Viennese public transport company. <laughs> so they have really a shortage uh, in workforce. So there are programs where they try to uh, do this. Uh, to do this, and I mean, not necessarily specifically from the automotive industry, but that's part of it, yeah. And on automation, I mean, this was not the focus of the interviews, so that's, I cannot really say anything about this. Okay, uh, and from this, I would like to give you some entry points for uh, transformative change on the policy level. And this was actually something that was very important, especially in the focus, focus groups. And a lot of, um, of workers said that it's hugely important that there are going to be political decisions. So and actually, that's also kind of an, an argument against this very widespread argument from politicians that say, well, uh, it's consumers that decide if they do not accept, we cannot do uh, anything. And I have some quotes that uh, kind of uh, say the opposite. Um, so one of them uh, said, I believe that the state, uh, so the politik uh, Germany has to, which is a little bit different from the state, but uh, that's why I wrote it down here, but I think you uh, get what it uh, means. I believe that the state has to decide. Consumption will follow. And uh, another one that is kind of uh, in the same line, what is needed from the state is an overall plan. And what it will certainly take is support so that you can try things. Of course, you can say the companies should have to take the risk, but I think these are societal topics where you have to say, okay, where do we want to go? So what is obvious, I think, from, from these quotes is that lacking political decisions, lacking direction of change, kind of support path dependency, and these unsustainable economic structures. So a lot of um, interviewees actually go in the direction of saying there has to be a kind of a paradigm shift from uh, consumer choice to political uh, decisions. And in the um, in the last slide, I would actually like to, to give you two policy domains where I think it's most important that there uh, is, um, is policy change. I think this is actually important because for a lot of um, climate relevant um, industries, the, the most important decisions are not necessarily in climate policies, but in related uh, policy sectors that make a huge difference if structural change can happen uh, or if transformative change uh, is likely or not. And I think uh, so. one of the most important um, 
aspect is actually industrial policy. And here, um, this is not necessarily something that only comes from uh, the interviews, but uh, we, we did a, a separate study kind of on the, the, um, the basic pillars and characteristics of industrial policy at uh, the EU level. And we can see there is a lot of focus now on innovation policies, so on investments in environmental friendly technologies, so especially with these, this focus on um, important projects of common European interest, so these, um, ver so these huge um, projects where uh, the EU really invests together in important uh, environmentally friendly technologies. But I think what is obvious from, from the, the, the interviews or when we, we look at it from a political economy perspective at that these innovation policies in a way have to complement it by um, a coordinating, coordinated downscaling of kind of the unsustainable uh, industries. So a downscaling of road transport, the automotive industry. Uh, in the literature this is called exnovation, so compared to innovation or phase out policies. So the termination of old uh, or unsustainable technologies, practices or sectors because this is nothing that happens automatically. So only because you have investments in in new technologies doesn't mean that the old ones go away, go away by themselves. But what, happen, what has happened basically uh, is that you have now ICE technology and uh, e-mobility, you now have fossil energy and renewable energy. So these uh, new technologies kind of complemented old ones, but they have not replaced old ones. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just a clarification. Is this aspect of downscaling, downscaling uh, coming also from the interviews? No, or it's no. Just no it's not coming from, uh, from the interviews. No, that, I mean the, the general, as the, the previous uh, interviews showed, I mean the idea that there, have, there has to be a plan, <laughs> there have to be political decisions on what is the transformation pathway to proceed. That's coming very much uh, from, from the interviews and then these uh, more policy oriented um, um, entry points come from from the literature, basically, and from other uh, ideas. So, and the second point, and I think uh, this is a very important, that industrial policies have to be complemented by active labor uh, market policies to increase legitimacy for transformative change on the one hand, but also to, to guarantee social security for workers in uh, these industries. And there are um, a lot of different um, examples, ideas for this uh, in, in the literature. Of course, that is actually a little bit related to your question uh, before. So retraining of workers is obviously important. But other, there are other examples to job guarantee, uh, work time reduction, but also in some industries it might be um, adequate to think about early retirement schemes or others. So this really depends very much on how is the composition of the workforce in the respective industries. Okay, so I give you, we've uh, developed, some, developed some of these uh, ideas in, in an article in Environmental Innovation and Societal Transitions 
on the characteristics of EU industrial policy. Mm. Okay, so to conclude, mm, I think such a, a focus on, on the automotive industry helps to better understand the structural barriers to transformation, but also to find entry points beyond consumer behavior and uh, user, uh, user acceptance. So to go on that, to really focus on uh, political decisions that are important for such a coordinated downscaling of unsustainable industries. And that actually the active involvement of workers' perspective is key to increase the legit legitimacy for transformative change, but also to guarantee that these transformations are actually just uh, transitions. That's uh, the, the term that is very often used for it. And as I said, mm, I think the, the, there is really there are not very, uh, not many studies that deal uh, with uh, the workforce in these transformation processes. And I think the interviews show uh, very nicely that there are actually a lot of ideas and also qualification and expertise that we can draw on in such a transformation process. Thank you very much.